Okay, so today we will, so last time we were talking about, what was that, uh, about the tensors, and in particular we worked a little bit on the Faraday tensor, describing electromagnetic forces. The last thing we did was the derivation of the transformation rule for, electric, for the electric and magnetic field based on uh, the transformation rule for the Faraday tensor. Now in this, in the same spirit, I would like to derive the Maxwell's equations using the Faraday tensor. So let me just remind you, we've got a tensor F mu nu. I don't want to make a mistake here. Yeah, here it is. Which in case of the upper index quantities has this form over here, minus E1, minus E2, minus E3. And then we've got the Bs, B3, minus B3, uh, minus B2, B2, and minus B1, B1, and not. Now, I claim that you can derive a part of the Maxwell's equations in the following way. Uh, assuming that the Faraday tensor depends on the point. We calculate df mu nu over dx mu. Uh, we will also introduce the following notation. Comma will, uh, will denote the differentiation with respect to the coordinate number nu. And here we are using again the Einstein summation condition, uh, convention. So this is in fact F mu naught, sorry, F mu naught naught plus F mu one comma one plus F mu two comma two plus F mu three comma three. Uh, I claim that this is supposed to be equal to four pi J mu or J mu is an object consisting basically of the charge density and the current density three vector. Okay, uh, so we will begin with the, so as you can see, there's in practice four equations encoded here because there's one free index and one index is summed over. So let's, look at this equation step by step. First, we'll begin with the zero index. So this is Q, F mu nu. Uh, okay, uh, maybe somebody might help me with this example. Okay, so I don't see anybody. So in principle, this is F zero, zero, zero. We have to sum over all indices plus F zero two two plus F zero three three. Now F zero zero is equal to zero. So this component goes out and we can write this as F O I comma I. I here runs from one to three. It denotes the spatial indices. Uh, and recall that F0i is simply the component number i of the electric field. So this is basically the electric field component i over dxi. Okay, so this is what, what is known as the divergence of the electric field. Uh, and what happens if we plug in this thing here. Well, we get four pi and the zero component. Well, and we'll discover one of the Maxwell's equations. Basically the Gauss law. Divergence of E is given by the charge density. Uh, any questions to this? Okay, I cannot hear any. So let's go here. Now the second, now we have to deal with the rest of the equations. So we've got F 
one alpha alpha. That's F one zero zero. Then there will be F one one one, but since F is anti-symmetric, there is no time F one one. So we can already jump to F one two two plus F one three three. Uh, okay, what's this thing over here? That's minus F zero one zero. And this was the first component of the electric field differentiate with respect to zero. So this the derivative with respect to time. And then we've got these two components. Again, let's go layer two to see what is going on here. Uh, so we are looking at component uh, zero. This, we are looking at component one, two. That's basically three, right? One, two is B three, one, two. So this is plus D B three over dx2. And then we've got one three, which is minus b2. So this is one derivative b2 with respect to x3. And that's basically, if you write, you can also write it in the following. This is de1 over dt plus the curl of the vector field b. And out of that, we take the first component. Let me deal with this layer. Okay, and then we can play the same game uh, for components F2. That's F2, zero, zero, plus F2, one, one, plus F2, three, three. Unsurprisingly, the first thing will be DE2 over DT plus uh, F21 is minus F12. So that, that, that's going to be minus D, sorry, let me do it this way, minus DB3 over DX1 plus D B one differentiate with respect to X three. That's this thing here. Two three is equal to B one. And that is when we look at that uh, again, that's minus D E two over D T plus the curl of B component two. And it's easy to check that this guy over here is just the third component of the electric field plus the third component of the curl of B. Okay, and this is basically supposed to be equal to four pi, the third, the second, and the first component of the electric current field. So altogether we obtain the following equation minus D E over D T plus the curl of B is supposed to be equal to four pi electric current. Okay, is it clear? Okay, I hope it is. We have rediscovered two equations, the Gauss law and, and the equation for the uh, curl of B. Uh, now there is one more, this is not the whole story. Uh, in order to obtain the rest of the equations, we will have to consider the, the following. Uh, we take, F mu nu alpha plus F mu alpha mu plus F alpha mu nu. This is supposed to be zero. Uh, what you see here is so-called cyclic permutation of indices. So we've got M mu, M mu nu alpha. Uh, then 
uh, we rotate all these indices to the left or to the right, it doesn't really matter. We get F mu alpha comma mu. We do it again, we get F alpha mu comma mu. We sum that up and this is supposed to be zero. And I claim this yields the rest of the Maxwell's equation. But I will leave it as an assignment. I will give you also some hints how to uh, how to do it. Okay, any questions? Hmm, again, I don't see any questions. So I suppose we can go on. Uh, so for people who have ju who have just appeared, we are still working. Uh, we are still uh, working with the uh, Maxwell's equations and the Faraday tensor. We have derived part of the Maxwell's equations, but not the whole of it. Just one more thing. So we've got the Maxwell equation of the form f mu nu equal to four pi j mu, where j mu is equal to density and current and current density. Now there is something funny going on here, and this has to do with the charge conservation. So as you probably know, if you had a good electromagnetism course, uh, in Maxwell's theory, charge is by definition conserved. It can't be otherwise. You cannot solve the Maxwell's equations in a consistent way if the charge is not conserved. By conservation, we simply mean that uh, any local change of charge density can only happen due to the influx of, uh, of current. And it turns out that this is a very easy thing to see here in this form of Maxwell's equations. Let's take this thing here and differentiate with respect to x mu on both sides. So the left-hand side, we can also write as f mu nu, f mu nu. And now there is something funny. Uh, differentiation with respect to mu and nu is a symmetric operation. So this is also f mu nu, f mu nu, right? Because there is no difference in the order of differentiation in, in uh, standard partial derivatives with respect to in the, with respect to coordinates. But then there is some something else we can do here. Uh, we can rename these indices. This, indices mu and nu are both sum over. So let's rename them and let's call mu nu and nu mu. So this one will be summed with that one and this one is summed with that one. It's the same thing, right? Because the summation goes exactly the same way. Okay. But now we can swap these indices here. Since F is anti-symmetric, this costs a sign change. And lo and behold, what happens? Compare this with this. We have just realized that F mu nu mu mu is equal to F minus F mu nu mu mu, which means that this has to be equal to zero. So this is all zero. On the other hand, if we differentiate the right-hand side, what we get is four pi to j mu mu. So it follows that this thing has supposed to have a vanishing for divergence. So let's write this equation in terms of, uh, of the decomposition into the time-like time part, the time-like component, which is rho, and the spatial components, j. It tells you that d rho over dt plus dji over dxi is equal to zero. This is the divergence of j. So we have just discovered the charge conservation. Meaning that the, on, the only possible local change of charge density may happen only because the, there is some kind of divergence of the currents. So yeah, 
it follows automatically from this part of Maxwell's equations that we have a charge, we have local charge conservation. Uh, please remember this mathematical trick. If we have a general antisymmetric tensor, a alpha beta, and we differentiate it twice, then this has to be zero because these two indices are antisymmetric and these two indices are symmetric. Uh, if we contract symmetric with antisymmetric, the result must be zero. Uh, okay, any questions to this part? Okay, there are none. So the next topic will be the Lorentz equations. So we are still working with electromagnetism a little bit, partially to practice, because this is curious and partially because this is a good way to learn the uh, tensorial calculus. Okay, so the Lorentz force. The Lorentz force is the total force acting on a point charge. So here is how we obtained. We assume that the charge has a mass m. The charge is u. In special relativity, the uh, first, the second law of uh, dynamics takes this following form. You take the derivative of the fourth velocity with respect to proper time, times m being the, the, the rest mass of our charge. And this is supposed to be equal to force. And the force in our case is simply q nu nu u nu, where u is the four velocity of our charge. Uh, okay, so let's try to uh, again decompose this equation. It's basically four equations because there is one external index mu. Index new appears on the right hand side and, and summed over. Uh, let's try to decompose it into the spatial components and the time component. So let's begin with the spatial components this time. Uh, we want to rediscover the Lorentz force as we know it. So what we get is QF J zero U zero. Uh, plus Q F J I U I. Okay, let's now. Oh, sorry, this was supposed to be J. Let's look at a particular case M D one over the tau. This will be Q E F. One not u not. Now, what is u? U with upper index is basically gamma times gamma velocity, which is, and if we lower this index, what we get is minus gamma gamma velocity. Okay. So f one zero is. Let's have a look at that. F one zero is minus E one. You can see it from here. Uh, this is minus gamma. And on top of that, we also have F one two U two plus Q F one three U three. F12 is just B3, F13 is just minus B2. And this is gamma D2, this is gamma D1. So this is basically gamma Q E1 plus 
B3, B2 minus B2, B3, which is gamma Q1 plus V cross B component one. And in fact, you can show that this formula also holds for other spatial components. So the derivative of the four velocity, the, the spatial components is just gamma Q E plus E B component J. And that's very nice. For small velocities, this is basically the standard three velocity. This is more or less one. So we recover uh, the standard Lorentz force in the non-relativistic limit as we wanted to. Uh, okay. Any questions? Okay, probably none. Uh, I have a question. Oh, yes, please, please go on. In the second step, uh, I miss why the index is lowered for the four velocity. You mean this one here? Yes. Uh, respect uh, to the first expression. Why is it lowered? Uh, well, that's pretty much the same as if we have written F mu nu upper index. Thanks for this question. It's actually a very good one. So you can always, uh, so, so I have written here F mu lowered nu times upper nu. But the thing is that I've got my, my, tensor F, my Faraday tensor has a slightly simpler form if both indices are upper indices. But I can always raise this one and lower that one. They're summed over and this amounts to exactly the same. So I was in fact looking at this expression rather than that one. And this expression, what you get here is J0, you lower zero, J1, you lower one. Is this clear? Yes, yes, thanks. So this is this is a useful computational trick. If you have x alpha y alpha, this is the same as x alpha y alpha. It's just two ways of writing the same thing. And this is in fact x alpha y beta g alpha beta. Uh, so learning properly to, to use this tensorial formulation and the Einstein summation convention is 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 largely about learning what kind of tricks you can play um, with algebraic tensorial expressions. And one of them is exactly changing the, uh, if you have two sum indices you sum over, you can change the, uh, you can swap which one is upper, which one is lower. A trick to remember. Uh, we also have the zero component, the time component. So let's let's try to work with the time component a little bit. Uh, so this is interesting because we already got our, we've already got our uh, Lorentz equations. There is three equations for the uh, Lorentz force. But apparently the equation I have written before has actually four components. So there's an additional one. And you might wonder what that's, that is. A kind of surpri relativistic surprise equation, which seems to be unrelated to the previous ones. So let's try to see what, what it looks like. That's Q F zero zero U zero plus Q F zero J U J. This is obviously zero. We are left just with this thing, and this is the electric force. And what we get is just Q gamma EI EI. This looks a bit strange, but when you think about it, this is basically E times V. And this thing here is nothing else but the work performed by the electric field on this charge or the energy gained. Because this thing here on the other hand is just d over d tau, assuming that the mass is constant of m times u zero. And that's just the change of the zero component of the four momentum. And that's basically the change of the energy in, in, in time. Obviously when your charge is following uh, a trajectory with electric field, uh, it might be gaining or losing energy depending on the, velo on the direction of velocity. Uh, it may speed up if it's already moving in the same direction as the electric field points out. I'm assuming that the charge is positive or um, it may be losing energy. And that's exactly what happens here. So 
the zero component of this equation is just the basically the energy conservation. Uh, okay. One more important thing. So we've got the equation <clears throat> of type. the derivative of this guy with respect to tau is equal to some kind of force. Uh, now, this thing is sometimes called the four acceleration. The derivative of the four velocity with respect to the proper time is a mu. And my claim is that this vector is always orthogonal to E, to U at all times. which means that if you decompose A uh, in the rest frame of, of our particle, it has only spatial components. Uh, why does this hold here? Well, we have to remember that uh, the four velocity was defined to be normalized to minus one. And now let's differentiate this with respect to the proper time. Uh, what we get here is two times the derivative of tau times beta times t alpha beta. Uh, the derivative may attack u alpha, it may attack u beta, and it may attack the metric. The metric is constant in, in, in a given frame. Uh, and these two, uh, and that you have two exactly identical terms with slightly different indices. So that's what you get. And this must be equal to zero and follows that two times the four acceleration times four velocity times g alpha beta is equal to zero and follows that we have this thing here. So uh, whenever you have an equation of this kind for the effective force acting on a point particle in special relativity, the force has to be also orthogonal to the momentary for velocity. There cannot be any force um, along directed along uh, u mu. That it cannot have a time-like component at any moment. That would be inconsistent. Mm, so in a co-moving frame, a mu is equal to zero a and force f mu is zero f. There's just three components of the force and three components of the momentary acceleration. And in our case, this makes perfectly sense because if you calculate, if you remember, we have t u mu over d tau equal to f mu 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 mu. Uh, we might try to multiply it by u mu to see if this is indeed orthogonal. And what we get on the right hand side is that uh, we get uh, m t u mu d tau u mu is equal to f u mu u mu u mu. This is anti-symmetric, an anti-symmetric tensor which we have uh, contract twice with the same in, with the same object and this must be equal to zero. It's easy to check because this is anti-symmetric. Okay, any questions to this part? Okay, I don't see any. So we have one more topic to cover on the blackboard lecture before we go to the proper lecture. Uh, let me go to the next blackboard. Uh, so fluxes, densities, and conservation laws. Okay, so the idea is that very often in physics and astrophysics, we work with a large collection of particles uh, moving in the space time. And it may, be, it may happen that there is too many of them and their interactions are too complicated uh, to follow each of them separately. In that case, it's customary to use 
something called the fluid approximation or continuum approximation. So instead of considering each particle individually, we pick up certain groups of particles in closed in a, in a, in a volume. Uh, and we define this way a fictitious uh, fluid element, which is supposed to represent some kind of average um, motion of, of particles within a region. Uh, and we consider uh, and we can we consider this uh, this fluid element on the other hand and and an, an infinitesimal small thing, and obtain a continuum approximation of this type of discrete of discrete matter content. This is a common theme in physics. Uh, I would like to say a few words how this is supposed to work in special relativity. Uh, so we assume that we have a collection of particles in co-moving frame. And let me draw a picture. So there is a... Over here. T. X, T, Z. I'll change the color a little bit. And we've got our particles with their word lines. One, two, three, four, five, six. You see the word lines? Uh, they seem at rest at the moment. And now let's also assume we have another frame in which we'll look at that. I will pick, for example, this color. That will be Z tilde and T tilde. And this frame will be called Q. The standard frame will be called P. So we assume that the number of particles is N. So there's n particles here. And I have drawn this in three in 2D, but you should understand that this is happening in 3D. Uh, they're all confined to a box. If you look at that in 3D projection, they're all confined to a box of volume delta V. Uh, let's call it delta N. And in that case, we can define the um, Co-moving density of of particles, as simply the density as observed in the frame P, which is co-moving with the particles. So that's that will be n zero equal to delta n divided by the volume. So there is just length here, but you should understand that this is three-dimensional volume in practice. So there is some kind of x and y uh, dimensions I'm not drawing here. Uh, this delta V is, by the way, delta X times delta Y times delta Z. Now, let's look at that uh, in the other frame. Look at that in the... So we are looking at this situation in order to understand how, what is the most convenient way to describe a situation like that when you have a large collection of particles, what kind of geometric object, uh, what kind of tensor or vector or one form would describe the best? Uh, the answer is that it will be a far vector, but we have to see it. Uh, we look at that in the boosted frame. Uh, boosted along Z. Yeah, so now it's fairly obvious that the Z size of this uh, box appears to be shortened, right? Uh, because now Delta Z has been changed into one over gamma 
delta z. That's the Lorentz contraction. So, however, it does not apply to the transverse dimension. So the delta v in the new frame is just delta x, delta y, delta z tilde, which is one over gamma delta v. So if we calculate the density of particles in this boosted frame, it will take the form of gamma times n zero. This looks pretty much like the transformation law of a zero component of a vector. And we'll see that indeed it works. But we'll need the rest of this vector. And in order to get the rest of this vector, we have to think about the uh, particle flux. Uh, so let's consider this situation again in the boosted frame. In the boosted frame, the particles appear to be moving uh, along the z-axis, uh, uh, but in the opposite direction. So let's fix some kind of z equal constant surface. Uh, and the observer Q will register a flux of particles. Uh, let's call it F in the direction of Z. So flux of particles. Well, all these particles will eventually cross this Z equal constant surface. They will begin with this one and then this one will be the last one to cross. Uh, so there will be delta n of them. Mm, they will cross in some time delta t. And the area they will cross will be some kind of delta a. But this delta a is nothing else but delta x times delta y. So mm, this boosted observer sees slightly shortened uh, box with the particles, but this box is moving in this direction. And over some period of time, this box will cross this z equal constant uh, surface. Now uh, it will cross obviously uh, the area element delta x delta y and what is the crossing time? Uh, the crossing time is basically recall that uh, The crossing time is basically the size delta z divided by velocity. So delta t is one over gamma delta z. This is the length of this box uh, in, the, in the moving frame. Uh, and this is divided by the velocity. Um, so this is one over gamma e uh, This is delta z over gamma z. Yeah, that's the result. Oh, and there is a minus here because these particles are moving from uh, are moving backwards. So the component of the flux, of the particles. Note that they are not moving in the x and y direction, so there is no flux in these directions. So the components of the flux, this is basically uh, delta n. Now I'm plugging in this formula here. This is delta x, delta y, delta z. And here you got gamma d. which is minus delta n over delta v gamma v. Okay, let's look at the at this result again. Uh, so what we have found out is that the new n has this form and our z has this form over here. 
that's again n zero and fx and fy is zero. Uh, does it ring a bell? It looks perfectly like a transformation law for a vector, four dimensional vector. Let's see it again on um, in details. So if we define the vector n zero 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 in the commoving frame and applied a Lorentz transform, we'll, we'll call this flux vector uh, what is capital N mu. Then if we boost it to the uh, Q frame, we get gamma and not zero zero minus gamma v and zero. That's in the boosted frame. Okay, very well. So it turns out that the following object we may define consisting of density and particle flux transforms like a four vector uh, under Lorentz boost and in fact also under all possible Lorentz transformations. We will not prove it, but this is true. So it makes sense to consider this a four vector. Uh, and this is very often called the uh, particle density vector. Or sometimes current. It's an object which combines the density of uh, particles, but also possibly charge or other things uh, with the spatial flux. Uh, yeah. Uh, and we have also seen that in a co moving frame. we have n mu equal to n zero, which is the uh, rest frame density and a zero vector. Uh, the magnitude of, the, of this vector, so n times n, you can quickly calculate that this is minus n zero squared. But this thing is valid in any frame, in Q or whatever other one. So the invariant magnitude of n is simply minus the square of of, in, of the invariant uh, commoving frame dense commoving density of objects. Uh, yeah. Uh, a few more observations. So uh, we pick another four velocity u alpha. It's just a four velocity of defining a frame and then it's easy to show that the uh, particle density uh, in this in the frame uh, with this for velocity is simply minus n mu u mu uh, it's easy to check because the density is the zero component. And if you multiply with u mu in a particular frame and this u mu is just the, 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 the timeline part, you get n zero. In a similar way, if E alpha is a spatial vector in this frame, so E alpha, u alpha equal to zero and it's also normalized. So it defines a direction, then this will be the flux across 
the flux of particles across the surface uh, orthogonal to E. E. So we imagine that we take a small surface orthogonal to this E, e tilde in this particular frame U bar, uh, U tilde, and we simply calculate the number of particles which cross the surface uh, in a given time. Uh, we assume that the we know the area of the surface and we just calculate the number of particles divided by area divided by the crossing time. And this will give us the flux of particles across a surface. So the bottom line is that this is a very useful object. Uh, yeah. By the way, these two, two uh, formulas look quite the same. So the flux across the surface and the density look are given by more or less the same uh, expression. And this is not really a surprise if you think of it for, for a second. Let's go back to this picture over here. If you think about it, uh, the density of particles is nothing else but It's nothing else but the flux through t equal constant. So if we consider a surface in the full space time given by t equal constant and we calculate the flux of particles through it, well, that's basically uh, nothing else but the density because uh, you just measure the number of particles which cross through a particular volume. And this volume is just delta x, delta y, delta z. Uh, you calculate the number of these particles. There is no delta t because there is no, no, no time. This happens in, in a particular time, but you have three spatial dimensions and that's your density. So you can think of, of, of the particle density in a particular frame as a flux uh, of particles through the space time through a t equal constant surface. Uh, is this geometric intuition clear to everyone? Okay, I hope it is. Okay. Uh, and the last thing will be the conservation law. We have already done this, but I will repeat this for the particles. Uh, we consider the equation of this type, or n mu comma mu equal to zero. Uh, it turns out that it has, if, if we write n, uh, it turns out that it simply has the form of d n zero over dt plus times the spatial n equal to zero. And that's the conservation law for this density, particle density. And this is divergence of flux. So if we assume the number of particles to be conserved, we have to impose additional this equation, which has a very nice, very simplified form in comparison with uh, everything else. So the nice thing is that we have kind of combined uh, two quantities. Uh, again, we have combined two quantities which in pre-relativistic physics are not closely related to each other. The particle density and the flux vector. It turns out that in relativistic physics, you can easily combine them into a single object which transforms very nicely under Lorentz transforms. And a more complicated equation take, takes a much simpler form. Uh, before that, we have seen that the Maxwell equations, that both electric and magnetic field can be nicely combined into an anti-symmetric rank to tensor. The density and the flux vector are combined to a four vector in a very convenient way. 
Okay, I think this is all for now. Do you have any questions? If not, then we can make a break. Okay, so it's already nine past 10. So we go back to our board lecture. Let me share the proper screen. So the next topic, and it's actually a pretty important one in relativity, is the stress energy tensor, a particular tensor which will play a big role in the future. The stress energy tensor. It's one of two geometric objects which are probably the most important one uh, for the for the topic for general relativity. Uh, the metric tensor is the most important one, but the stress energy tensor is the second most important one, and we have to understand it a little deeper. So we are back to the same situation as before. We've got some kind of fluid consisting of particles. Here we have the particles. And the idea is that the same way we could consider the flux of the particles themselves, we, we can consider the flux of something more, uh, let's say, uh, refined, namely the flux of the form momentum each of these particle carries. So these are massive particles. They Each of them carries some kind of form momentum with, with itself. And so given some kind of fluid element, which we see over here, we can define the flux of every component of the total uh, form momentum uh, and also the density of every component of the form momentum. So the stress energy tensor is a tensor of rank two with two upper components. It's usually denoted by T and it's defined in, this, in the following way. Uh, T mu zero is the density of mu component of or momentum. And T mu i is the flux of the mu component of or momentum of the line of, of a particular fluid element through the xi equals constant surface. And we can again break this down into, uh, into even finer distinction. So we again distinguish the zero and the spatial components of mu. And in that case, T0, zero, zero is the uh, density of the zero momentum, uh, zero component of momentum, that is energy. T0 I is the flux of energy. So each of these particles carries energy. If the particles move through a surface, they carry some kind of energy with themselves through xi equal constant. Ti zero is the density of momentum. Ti, momentum component. Tij is the flux of the momentum component. Now, the strange thing about the stress energy tensor is that it has to be positive, it has to be symmetric. So T mu nu, is always equal to T mu mu. This is not so obvious from this definition, but you can prove that. We will not do it here, but you can have a look at the Schutz, first, Schutz G, I think mean first course in GR, and it's in chapter four. There is a short proof why this has to be the case. Okay, any questions to the definition of the stress energy tensor? It's a bit of an important topic, so if there are any, it's, it's a good time to ask them. Okay, I don't see any, so number 11. So let's think what happens if the situation is exactly the one we have seen on the previous blackboard, namely, we've got this, we've got a bunch of commoving, exactly commoving particles with the same uh, for velocity. Uh, just going passing through the space time. So each fluid element consists of 
particles which have exactly the same for, for velocity. This type of matter is known as dust. So dust, non-interacting co-moving particles. We don't assume they're co-moving globally in the whole space-time, but at least within each fluid element. What is the stress energy tensor in this case? So we assume that all particles have the same mass. So in our case, for momentum for each particle is just m0000, each particle. And we have the particle density, m0000. In that case, the energy density is, well, that's fairly obvious. It's m0, which is the mass and energy at the same time, because c is equal to one, and that's it. On the other hand, since we are co-moving with these particles, there are no fluxes. So T0i is equal to zero. The i0 is also equal to zero because there is no spatial components of the, of the form momentum of any of the particles. None of them contributes. So each particle contributes is m0000 to the total form momentum, but there is nothing to contribute here. And the same goes for Tij. Yeah. And this means that in this co-moving frame, this is equal to new and okay now n0 can be considered a scalar basically the square root of this thing here the rest mass is also a scalar so we can write this thing as n0 times m0 and this is sometimes known as the invariant commoving energy density and instead of that we use u mu and u nu, the four velocity of each fluid element. And this is the most common expression. T mu nu is just equal to zero, u mu, u nu. This is the, let's say, rest mass density. That's the stress energy tensor for dust. Now we have derived these equations in the co-moving frame, but note that these equations here have tensorial nature. They're tensorial. A tensor is just a product of two four vectors, or a tensor is a product of a scalar and two vectors, or a tensor is a product of a scalar or two vectors. And if it is so, then these equations I have I have written here. These equations are valid in any frame. So one of fundamental problems of notation in, in, in tensorial calculus is that sometimes certain equations are true in a particular frame, like this one over here. That's a more general remark. So this, these equations over here are valid in a particular co-moving frame, but not valid in general. In a general frame, uh, the form momentum and n do not have to have this type of simplified form. And in fact, they will not. However, we have written down, uh, we managed to derive certain uh, tensorial relation between two tensorial objects, which is valid in the co-moving frame. But these, these relations transform appropriately both left and right-hand side under any kind of Lorentz boosts or any kind of frame transformations. So they are valid in any frame. So there is a fundamental difference between these uh, green and the blue ones. Of course, the blue ones are some, somehow more uh, interesting from the point of view of special relativity. Uh, they are more general. They have a bit more uh, invariant meaning to them. Uh, in fact, this, this duality of, of notation, sometimes we have certain, uh, sometimes certain uh, equations hold in a particular frame or frames and sometimes they hold universally this was a bit of a problem uh, which the notation which many people tried to solve with the notation uh, roger penrose and bob wald derived something called the abstract index notation in which uh, certain types of indices are used only for uh, equations of tensorial nature which are valid in any frame and you use the standard indices for 
for relations which happen to hold in a particular frame, but not gen in general. We will not use it here, but if you're curious, this is called the abstract index notation, and you can read about it in, in Wald. This is in Wald's textbook. I don't remember the chapter number. We will not use it here. We will simply, if by definition, most of, of the relations we'll write will be of tensorial nature value in any frame. But if a particular relation is supposed to be valid only in one frame, we'll just notify it. Uh, we'll just write it somewhere nearby. Okay, one more thing about the stress energy tensor. Where does it have its name from? The answer is that if we decompose this tensor in a general frame, what we get is the energy density, the energy flux, uh, the momentum density, and the flux of momentum, and this is nothing else but the stress. If you have ever taken a course on continuous media, you have probably come across something called the stress tensor, which defines the stresses within a material. Well, it turns out that the stress energy tensor combines four, three, four different objects, the energy density, which is in scalar in relativistic physics, the energy flux, which is a vector, uh, the uh, density of momentum, which is also a vector, and the stress tensor, which is a three-dimensional tensor in uh, standard continuous media mechanics. So it's it's even more uh, surprising quantity than uh, than this than the Faraday tensor. It unifies even more things. Okay, let's go to the next page. Uh, the stress energy tensor is conserved. So. It seems to us that locally the energy is conserved. The energy can change only because of the influx of energy and, and the same applies to momentum. And this means that the following equation holds in special relativity. This is the energy momentum conservation. It has exactly the same status as the number of particles conservation or the, or the uh, charge conservation. Simply locally, each of the components of the four uh, of the uh, for momentum has to it has to be conserved individually. It can only change because of some kind of flux from the outside or outflow uh, from a particular point. Okay, one more thing. For perfect fluids, so the type of matter we have discussed on the previous on the previous blackboard, um, this one over here, the dust is a very particular type of matter. It's fairly useful in cosmology because you can very much it turns out that the dark matter very, seems to be pretty much well approximated by this type of non-interacting particle. Uh, however, in more general situations, uh, the matter has a bit more complicated form. The particles of matter do interact. And then the next best approximation I can think of is the approximation of a perfect fluid. So perfect fluid is described by the energy density and the pressure. And without much justification, I will just write that in a co-moving frame, the stress energy tensor is diagonal with zeros everywhere outside the diagonal. The zero, zero component unsurprisingly gives the energy density, uh, but in the special part, you've got the pressure on the diagonal. You can write down the conservation law for the uh, stress energy tensor, assuming that you have a perfect fluid or dust. And it turns out that what you get from that is basically the Euler equations for the fluid. I think the derivation is also in Schultz. We will not do it here. Any questions to the stress energy tensor? its physical meaning, its geometric properties. Okay, I don't see any. If not, then we can go uh, to the next part of the lecture. Yeah, we are over here. So let me share the screen. Okay, so now it's, it's time for the next full lecture. In the previous lectures, we were discussing uh, tensor algebra and now we, are back, we go back to general relativity. Uh, we, we assume we know special relativity, we know tensor algebra, and now we would like to understand what kind of physical intuitions uh, are behind general relativity. What were 
what were the Einstein's ideas? How, how did he arrive at general relativity? What were his postulates? So the motto of, of this lecture is written right over here. Gravity is just geometry in disguise. Uh, if there is just one sentence I would like you to understand from, uh, to remember from, from uh, these lectures, it is, I think, this one. Uh, so it may be a bit unclear to you what this actually means, that gravity is just geometry in disguise. We'll slowly develop this idea. You'll see exactly how, how this works. Let's begin with intuitions behind general relativity. So imagine you are Albert Einstein in um, around 1910. You're thinking about gravity and, and relativity. You have just discovered special relativity. You're very happy. Uh, you are very deeply convinced that special relativity works. Um, there is a lot of, there is real physics in it. It seems that mm, many laws of physics obey the symmetries of special relativity. It seems to supersede the standard Newtonian and Galilean treatment of space-time very well. Uh, we know that the Maxwell's equations describing electromagnetic forces are compatible with special relativity. In fact, it's more than that. Uh, it turns out that basically special relativity was designed to, to um, uh, keep the speed of light and the Maxwell's equations invariant. So unsurprisingly, the Maxwell equations are exactly compatible with special relativity. But the second most important interactions in, in nature, the gravity, uh, the Newtonian gravity seems incompatible uh, on many levels. For example, the standard Newtonian gravity assumes that the gravitational force uh, is instantaneous. There is no delay between uh, what is happening to a body and its gravitational action on other bodies. And this is not very much compatible with special relativity, where interactions can only propagate with the light speed, speed of light or slower than speed of light. Obviously, gravity, Newton gravity is incompatible with special relativity, so we, knew, we need a new gravitation theory, which is somehow compatible with Newtonian gravity for slow motions, but otherwise more compatible with special relativity. But keep in mind that as we stated in the first lecture, gravity is different than other interactions in a couple of ways. First of all, it cannot be shielded, unlike electromagnetic forces. It just acts on everything, on every mass. No matter what you do, every mass feels gravity. Of, uh, uh, if you fly close to the Earth, you feel its gravity no, no matter what you do. But there is one more interesting uh, thing with gravity. Uh, something that uh, is absent in other interactions, and this is called the equivalence principle and played a big role in the formulation of general relativity. So we will discuss it a little bit in detail. So let's begin with something that is known as the weak equivalence principle. Uh, it was already noticed before Einstein, and in fact, uh, considered very much um, from experimental perspective around the time Einstein was formulating general relativity. So in Newtonian physics, mass appears uh, in two different ways. First of all, you've got, we've got the inertial mass, uh, which appears in the, in the Newton's second law of, of dynamics. Force creates, uh, causes acceleration. Uh, and inertial mass is simply the coefficients which, which connects these two. It, it measures how much the body opposes a force. It has to yield somehow, it has to undergo some kind of acceleration, but how big this acceleration is going to be that depends on the inertial mass. So it measures how much a body wants to sort of keep its constant velocity and how much it opposes any force trying to force it out from, from this situation. But on the other hand, mass also appears in the Newton's uh, gravity uh, as a coefficient uh, between, uh, as a coefficient which multiplies the gradient of the gravitational potential, uh, and this way gives the gravitational force. So it's the counterpart of charge in electromagnetism, except that uh, it acts a little bit differently. There's a minus here. But what is really interesting is that it seems that these two coefficients, which are logically two very different things, one of them is a universal uh, coefficient, which tells you how 
your body will react to forces. The other is the charge of gravitational interactions. It seems that they are very much equal. In 1909, Oetfers performed his famous experiments where he managed to prove that they're equal with fairly high precision, and this precision was even improved later. So we've got weak equivalence principle one, that the inertial mass and the gravitational mass are exactly the same things. And this has a, an interesting consequence. Uh, if you plug in the uh, gravitational force as the only force acting on a body, both masses being equal, they will disappear from the equations and, and the equation of motion will take the form that acceleration is minus the uh, gradient of the gravitational potential. And that's interesting. It means that the mass has nothing to do with the way a body responds to gravity, its own mass. All bodies, independent of their masses, uh, without if, if there are no other forces present, uh, all other bodies in free fall, fall uh, undergo the same acceleration in a given gravitational field. This is very much unlike electromagnetic radio. Uh, this is very much unlike the electromagnetic interactions where obviously bodies with different charges react differently to the same uh, electric field. And that's the second formulation of the weak equivalence principle. Bodies with different masses are equivalent in the sense that they fall in the same way in gravity. Uh, the idea, and now this, this, this uh, observation uh, provokes the following idea. The set of trajectories of free falling bodies must be something very fundamental. Uh, in electromagnetism, there is no such thing as uh, trajectories of, of, of bodies in, in free fall because bodies with different charge behave differently. But bodies with different masses in, in the gravitational field behave, behave in the same way. So maybe the set of trajectories of free falling bodies should not be considered an effect of a force, but rather some kind of fundamental property of the space time itself, somehow built, in, uh, built into the, this notion itself rather than effect of a force acting on a particular body. Uh, another interesting thing happens when we consider the gravity within a very small box. So we've got a gravitational field, again, within perfectly within Newtonian theory, no special relativity whatsoever. Uh, we pick up a very small box. Within this box, we can approximate the gravitational field to be more or less constant. And if it isn't, then we can shrink our box accordingly. And we may consider a bunch of particles in free fall, which we observe. It's easy to solve the equations of motion in this case. X double dot is a constant vector, so X has this form over here. It's just an exercise in ordinary differential equations, rather a simple one. But something interesting happens when we consider the relative motions of these free free falling bodies, one with respect to the other. Namely, this constant g t squared term disappears, and we're just left with a constant term and a linear term, meaning that these bodies are actually moving with constant velocity with respect to each other, which is, I think, quite interesting. They look as if they were uh, under, they look as if they were undergoing some kind of parabolic motion, motion uh, in, a, in, in other frames. But when you look at the motion uh, between themselves, it's just moving with constant velocity with respect to each other, at least within this small box. Once, the, once they move far away from each other, this will change. But as long as they're kept in a small box, this turns out to be true. Uh, sir, can you please explain this thing again, if you don't mind? Yes. This okay. small box thing. Okay, so we take we take a small box. So, so we take a gravitational field. It does not have to be uniform. Mm -hmm. Then we pick a small box, uh, and within this box, we can easily we can approximate the field to be more or less constant. Okay. If the box is sufficiently small, we don't see any any spatial variation or any temporal variation of the gravitational field. Now, within this box, we drop a number of free falling particles. Uh, in this case, I have drawn the, the gravitational force to be acting downwards. So every, every 
every of the, every object in free fall just un, uh, simply undergoes a, 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 this type of parabolic motion. Yeah. But when you consider two different uh, objects of this kind and, and measure the relative motion between them, right? So you, you take x and x prime, which which go, uh, which solve this equation separate with different initial data. The difference looks like this. So there is a constant term plus a linear term, which is which is basically the velocity difference. So the relative position of one body with respect to the other is just uh, basically the when you fix one body the other one appears to be moving with constant velocity and this goes for every pair of of, of these free falling bodies yeah okay so yeah i see that this gravity thing is disappearing in this small box okay. exactly so the thing is that uh, if you look at this from the from the reference points of the box you see the acceleration term but the bodies themselves, when they measure their relative differences, don't see this acceleration term, this constant acceleration term. They just see the motion with constant velocity with respect to each other. And this and velocity will be in like, uh, I will measure with respect to which frame, like this V uh, will be on the so, ref inertial frame, this V. Uh, we are not talking about inertial frame yet. Okay. We're just measuring the velocity. The velocity is measured with respect to some kind of external frame in which we see this gravitational field uh, downwards. Okay. Okay. But then we pass to the to the reference frame of each of these individual par particles in free fall, and we see that any other particle appears simply to be moving with constant velocity. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the effect of, and the interesting thing is that this effect of gravity, this type of uniform downwards gravitational field, is perfectly identical to the effect of an inertial force in a frame accelerating in. Uh, in a frame accelerating in the precisely uh, opposite direction. So imagine that we have no gravitational field. Uh, you're in a complete free floating in a, in a space time. However, your reference frame is accelerating in the exact opposite direction. It turns out that you'll see exactly the same type of picture. Uh, the all particles would uh, basically the equations of motions for all particles will, will look exactly the same with, with an additional inertial force, which is a constant term exactly like G. So the effect of gravity in the box is identical to the effect of inertial forces in a frame accelerating with uh, negative, uh, with acceleration meaning being minus G. So this is another formulation of weak equivalence principle the motions of free falling masses are the same in an uniformly accelerated frame and in a gravitational field in a sufficiently small region of space time. So if we pick, if we take a small box within which the gravitational field is more or less constant, uh, what we see is that everything behaves exactly in the same way as if we were without any gravitational field, but simply in an accelerating frame. Uh, the corollary is that you can always get rid of a gravitational field locally by passing to a free falling frame. Simply the derivative of phi locally is just G zero plus, uh, that's basically, let's say that's the derivative at the center of this box plus additional terms, uh, which are due, tidal force, due to tidal forces. If you make the box sufficiently small, they don't matter anymore and you just have a constant field G. And you can get rid of this constant field G if you pass to the free falling frame of any of these particles. You'll, it, it will seem that the gravitational field has disappeared. Einstein formulated this principle in, in terms of his famous uh, elevator Gedanken experiment or thought experiment. So we are comparing two physical situations. One of them is that we are in, an observer is closed in an elevator without any windows. Uh, right here on earth, the elevator is not moving with respect to the surface of the earth. And the observer is just throwing a ball, performing some kind of simple mechanical experiment, observing what happens with the ball. The ball will bounce off the wall and then fall to the ground uh, with a parabolic uh, type of trajectory. And now compare it 
to, the, to the following situation. Somewhere very far in the upper space, far outside the influence of gravity of any kind of massive bodies, uh, we've got the same type of uh, elevator, but with a jet engine uh, attached to it over here. And we assume that the engine produces thrust, which causes acceleration equal exactly to the acceleration of the Earth. And the other guy is performing precisely the same experiment. The funny thing is that the results of all, exp all experiments of this kind will be exactly the same. So sitting in, a, in, in the gravitational field of Earth uh, within a, in a small box and sitting in a rocket which is accelerating feels exactly the same. Uh, you can also frame the same story in a bit of a different way. You compare two different situations. You've got somebody in a rocket in the outer space, uh, this time not accelerating, simply staying in the, in, the, in the free fall. So with zero gravity, you can see the astronaut here floating inside the cabin. On the other hand, you can compare it to the uh, uh, to the situation when the same thing happens, but close to a inside the solar system, for example, close to the Saturn, close to the Saturn, and now the rocket might be performing a complicated maneuver in the solar system. For example, some kind of gravitational assist in order to leave the solar system, uh, traveling over a complicated uh, trajectory between Saturn and, and another planet. However, when you're sitting inside this rocket, you don't see any difference whatsoever without any thrust of the of the two engines over here uh, the astronaut inside will feel no difference whatsoever even though in the first situation the rocket is just standing still in, a, in the free space in the second in the second situation uh, it is making possibly a complicated trajectory in the solar system and the reason is that the complicated gravity of saturnus and other other planets uh, can be completely cancelled if you if you move to, to a free fall free falling frame of the rocket. Is it clear? I hope it is clear. Yeah, I actually I have this question. So what you will actually do is that uh, you will find a frame uh, which is keep accelerating in a way that it will it will eliminate the gravity, right? Yes. So but then this frame will be non-inertial, right? Because it's accelerated frame, right? Uh, we will get to that just in a few okay. minutes. Okay. This is a bit of a surprise when you do relativity. Okay. Uh, it's accelerating, so it seems it's not inertial, but that's a bit more complicated than that. In fact, one of the first steps toward general relativity is to realize, is, is to identify what is the, uh, what is the uh, inertial frame in this case. Okay. So we would like to reconcile gravity uh, the internal gravity with special relativity. But special relativity uh, is all about inertial frames and how things happen, what happens in inertial frames. There are an, an essential notion here. So what are really the inertial frames if we have gravitational forces present? So imagine you are close to the Earth. The, this blue spot is the Earth. The Earth creates its own gravitational field, which is radial and in, inwards. What would you call the uh, inertial frame in this case? The your first guess would be probably to use the Earth's crust uh, rest frame because this is what you do when you do your first mechanics course. You solve and you solve mechanics problems happening on the table, uh, and you consider this table an inertial frame plus a gravitational force. Uh, but Einstein claims that this is not the right thing to do. In fact, it's not the Earth's crust frame. It is the free falling frames or the local inertial frames, which are the real counterpart of special relativity inertial frames. So instead of considering a developing your frame around the Earth's crust and some kind of material uh, objects uh, on Earth, you should rather think of a small box uh, somewhere in the Earth's gravitational field. And for example, some kind of free falling satellite which passes through this region. And this satellite will define a free falling lo or local inertial frame. It will not feel the gravity of Earth because it's free falling. Uh, the gravity of Earth will be cancelled exactly by the acceleration of this object with respect to the Earth as we, as we watch it here. 
However, it is this frame which is the counterpart of the local inertial frame, quite surprisingly. And hence the Einstein's equivalence principle. In small regions of space-time, so within these boxes where the gravitational field may be considered uniform, in local inertial frames, all laws of physics reduce to their special relativity form. And this goes for electromagnetism, thermodynamics, and so on. Meaning, uh, and this is an important idea. It means it, it gives the it gives us the hint how we should generalize the laws of physics we know uh, uh, to the situations when we have a gravitational field present. The correct thing to do is to pass to a frame which is free falling and local. And locally within the small region of space time, the small box, uh, everything should boil down to the laws we have derived for special relativity. Uh, however, the, the frame related to the crust of the Earth should be treated as an accelerating one, quite counterintuitively. On the other hand, maybe it's not so surprising because we really see things falling down in this frame exactly as we would do in an accelerating frame. So maybe it's not a stupid idea. Is this clear now? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. The important part is that this is a very local construction. You cannot extend it very far away. Uh, and another important thing is that the, these frames are not compatible with each other. In order to get rid of gravity in this upper frame, we have to accelerate downwards, but sorry. Uh, in order to get rid of gravity, as gravity here, we have to accelerate in a different direction. So we cannot get rid of the gravitational field once and for all over the whole space time. Unless this is a, unless this is a constant uniform gravitational field, but they don't really exist in nature. So another idea I would like to, to leave you with is that gravity is not really a force. It's more of an effect of the free falling or, or inertial frames at various points being incompatible with each other. Uh, we would love to work in, in, in a frame in which there is no inertial forces. Everything is very simple. Everything boils down to special relativity, but it turns out that in presence of mass, massive bodies, this is not really possible. Uh, it doesn't mean that there are no inertial frames anymore, but it means that inertial frames at different points are not compatible and we cannot get rid of inertial forces everywhere at the same time. And that's gravity. Okay. Okay. So the equivalence principle was probably the most important uh, intuition behind the development of general relativity. Another one, which was not that important, but still arguably quite seriously, seriously influenced Einstein was something called the Max principle. And in order to understand it, we have to go back to special relativity and, and even Newtonian mechanics. So Newtonian mechanics and special relativity are both developed around the notion of inertial frame and also inertial forces, uh, non-rotating frame, frames and so on. And this, these notions, inertial frames, uh, inertial forces are fixed and determined by the structure of space-time. There's simply a fixed, a set of frames which we declare to be inertial and which our laws have certain simple form. However, it was noted even before Ernst Mach that the frames in which, which seem to be non-rotating with respect to, to, to the local dynamics also pretty much coincide with, with the frames in which we don't see the whole matter of the universe to be rotating. Uh, so, it was Max's idea that possibly this, this is not accidental. Maybe it is the motion and distribution of masses in the universe, which in fact dictates or somehow influence what an inertial frame is and what inertial forces bodies actually uh, suffer or, or, or feel at a given moment. So the idea is simply that the matter or motions of distribution of mass of the universe to somehow contribute to the local definitions of inertial frame accelerating frame or not non-rotating frame. Uh, now, Mach was somewhat vague about what exactly he means by contributing. Uh, 
and in fact, there are many interpretations of, of, of the Max principle. Albert Einstein in his general relativity uh, managed to show that the motions and the dis distribution of matter determines the structure of the geometry of the space-time. And this way also somehow contributes to the notion of inertial frames. So general relativity he developed turned out to be consistent with some, but not all of Max's intuitions. We'll not go deeper into that. Uh, if you're curious, I can send you articles about that. Uh, but the, the final note is that in some sense, his relativity theory is uh, compatible with some of Max's thoughts. Indeed, the motions of, of big masses influence what we call inertial frame and non-rotating frame. However, it's not that it is determined 100% by these motions. Any questions to the Max principle? I don't see any. So the last element uh, I would like to talk about are the non-Euclidean on curved geometries. Uh, so in general relativity, Einstein postulated that the space-time is mm, has a geometry, but this is not a standard Euclidean or flat geometry. It's a more complicated one. And I would like to give you an intuition of what we mean by curved geometry. So Euclid, one of the greatest mathematicians of, uh, of ancient Greece, uh, based his geometry as, as, as a formal system, deductive system, on the notions of points and straight lines and postulated a couple of properties these, these notions should, should uh, satisfy. One of them was a postulate about the existence of parallel straight lines. Over the centuries, this, this postulate was a bit controversial. Mathematic some mathematicians felt that maybe it's not really necessary. Maybe it somehow follows from the from something more basic or maybe from other postulates. And a couple of geometers work on, worked on that. But later on the 18th century in Europe, uh, it was slowly becoming clear to mathematicians that in fact, the fifth postulate is independent from the others. And in fact, moreover, you can actually invent geometries when, in which this is not true. And in particular, in early 1800s, three important mathematicians, Karl D. Gauss, Pokaz Boyai, and Nikolai Wobotevsky, simultaneously, independently from each other, uh, described a special type of geometry called um, hyperbolic geometry, in which pretty much everything works the way Euclid imagined, except that the fifth postulates about a uh, single parallel line to a given line is not true. Uh, this way, mathematicians got used to the idea that you can do geometry differently than uh, Euclid did. And in particular, Georg Bernhard Riemann in mid 19th century uh, provided the most, uh, probably the most general generalization of, of uh, geometry to more complicated situations, a general theory of non Euclidean spaces in any dimension and with any kind of curvature. The basic idea is that we've got a, a surface or, or, or an object on which this geometry lives. We've got a point dependent matrix which gives us the angles and distances, meaning uh, given a vector, you can, you can measure the, the, the angle between the two vectors and you can also measure distances. Moreover, there's a set of special curves through each point and in any direction called geodesics. These are the counterpart of straight lines, except that they behave in general somewhat differently. They can intersect even if they were parallel initially. However, in any vicinity of in the vicinity of any small point, if you focus on a small uh, part of the space time, everything looks as if we were in a flat geometry, or at least not very far from that. So, in a particular coordinate system, in the vicinity of a given point. Uh, these special curves will look like straight lines. And this is called ever, this is true everywhere. Mm, okay, so maybe the last slide. Now look at the following. There's a couple of analogies between non-Euclidean curved geometries and the space-time with gravity, which Einstein noticed around, nine, around 1910. So, Non-Euclidean geometries and Riemann's geometry was something like a relatively new mathematics. Uh, it, was, it was basically published, the first results were published only 50 years earlier. 
uh, physicists were not in general familiar with these results. Einstein was, and he noticed the following uh, analogies. So in non-Euclidean geometries, you have a point-dependent matrix, which defines angles and distances over, over your, your geometry. In a space-time with gravity, we also have a metric which defines angles, distances, but also the time flow, the velocities, and the speed of light. In non-Euclidean geometries, you have a set of special curves through each point in any, any direction called geodesics. Um, in Riemann's geometry, they extremize the distance between two points. They're simply the shortest lines connecting two points. On the other hand, in space and gravity, you have the world lines of masses in free fall, which are, as, as we notice, very important, and which are also defined at any point and in any direction. Uh, any non-Euclidean geometry looks like looks locally flat in an infinitesimally small neighborhood of any point. On the other hand, we also notice from the weak equivalence principle that physics looks consistent with special relativity in an infinitesimal small neighborhood of any point or in any local initial frame. So there is a direct analogy. There is a way to look at any geometry in a small neighborhood uh, as being very close to a flat one. And there is also a way uh, to look at the physics around any point in the space-time uh, in which physics looks pretty close to special relativity if the region we consider is small enough. However, this doesn't hold on larger distances. The, we'll talk about this, but uh, you cannot look on, on, on a non-flat geometry uh, in a flat way if distances are large enough. And this is also consistent with what we know about local inertia frames. They're only local. You cannot extend them to larger distances because inertial frames in different points are inconsistent with each other in general. So obviously, there are some analogies between these notions. And the main idea of Einstein is that gravity is the effect of the space-time geometry becoming curved. OK. I think this is it for today. Do you have any questions? OK, I don't see any questions. Just to everyone, uh, I would like to remind you that there will be a second assignment, a second problem sheet this, this year, uh, this week. And I think this is it. So see you next week then.